I'll just go live. All right, okay, I think we're live now. So, uh, hello everybody. This is a episode of COVID Conversations. Uh, with me today, I have Tim. Um, so I'm gonna let him introduce himself. All right, shout out to everybody watching and, and thank you to uh, Dr. Wilson for having me on. So I've been covering the vaccine rollout and the SARS-CoV-2 claims from the mainstream and also looking at the alternative perspectives on my channels across the internet. I've been heavily censored and um, it's been very interesting and I think I've come to a very different conclusion than uh, Dr. Wilson, so it'll be interesting to discuss. All right, cool. So we are here to talk about COVID vaccines and COVID vaccine safety, I think is the topic that we agreed that we would start with. So um, we didn't really pick a specific topic to start with, but how about uh, we start with you just letting me know um, what's, what's the one big reason that you maybe think that COVID vaccines are not safe? Um, you wanna start there? Sure. Yeah, so my definition of safety is there's no chance of you getting hurt. If, if someone's gonna say this vaccine is safe, to me that means it's not dangerous, dangerous being defined as has the possibility of hurting you. And so first of all, it's a procedure in which you get stabbed multiple times, poking a hole in your muscles. So that's harm right there. And also um, we've seen multiple reports of people just passing out right after their vaccine, hitting their heads. We've seen people get in car crashes. All of this is documented in VARs. Now, I'm not saying that every report is verified. I'm sure you would say that they're unverified reports, but I've read so many of the 1.4 million bars reports that you start seeing patterns. So I'd ask maybe um, just to keep it as a Socratic conversation. How many bars reports have you read, Dr. Wilson? Uh, okay, so let's start with uh, the beginning there. Um, I think we disagree on what the definition of safe is. Um, by your definition, nothing would be safe. Um, everything could possibly cause harm. So I don't think that's a useful definition of safe. Um, these vaccines uh, are safe in the sense that adverse events from them are extremely, extremely rare. Um, in regards to pass people passing out, um, that's something called syncope. Uh, that happens with a lot of different, just injections in general. Uh, it has to do with the vasovagal nerve um, and people can just pass out. Um, it's one of the reasons they ask you to um, stay in the um, waiting room for 15 minutes after you get your vaccine. And for people with a history of syncope, they especially want to watch you um, after you get vaccinated to make sure you're not going to just pass out uh, because of that syncope. Again, it's a characterized thing. So, I mean, the, do you... that, that's just one example I should point out. Uh, right, and, but and if we had had this conversation at the beginning, um, obviously my claims would have been a lot more um, easy to dissect, but I feel like I've been vindicated in a lot of ways. These people who told us it's safe and effective, there's no side effects. Reuters ran a piece that they said there's only two side effects over 2%. They said headaches at 3.8%, no, excuse me, fatigue at 3.8% and headaches at 2%. They failed to mention that they were completely misreading the Pfizer data and they were talking about grade three or worse side effects. So there's a grading scheme there. But looking at the uh, side effect sheet here, let me just read these out. This is Pfizer's own fact sheet for community. Pain at the injection site, 84%. Fatigue, 63%. Headache, 55%. Muscle pain, 38%. Chills, 32%. Joint pain, 24%. Fever, 14%. Injection site swelling, 10.5%. Injection site redness, 9.5%. Nausea, 1.1%. And it continues. And that's just for the first right. series for in blood. So, yeah, that... Like more people are being harmed than not. So I don't know how you can call that safe. Well, those are all very mild side effects. Those are side effects that you can find with the placebo even. I mean, those things just happen. And a lot of those happen because of your body generating an immune response. For example, a headache, a fever, that's expected when your body is mounting an immune response to something. So, um, and I don't think that anyone ever said that there are no side effects. There's no such thing as no side effects. Um, the question always is, what's the risk benefit analysis? Are the benefits going to outweigh the risks? And for COVID vaccines, the answer is unequivocally yes. So uh, that's a, that list of side effects, that list of side effects you read, I think 
exemplifies that because those are all very mild side effects that people can get over within a day. Yeah, well, you know, I just look at that as a separate question. Is, do the benefits outweigh the risks and is it worth taking on the risks and the unknowns? Is different than is this product safe? And we were assured this product is safe. For me, that's not really like the trade-off between risks and benefits. That's saying that the product doesn't have risks. And I, it sounds like you disagree, but I don't think it, it's a get out of jail free card to say, well, this is a class of products, injectables, where you know these side effects are common and it's an immune response. That'd, li that'd be like me saying, I can punch you in the face because that's a normal response for this type of insult. I don't, I don't see the logic in that at all. I don't see that as a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, not sure. I, I think that, you know, you're coming into this fundamentally thinking that you're having this unrealistic expectation that there should be zero side effects and that if there aren't zero side effects, then it's not safe. And I don't think that's the case. I mean, eating food is generally safe, right? But things can happen with eating food that can make you sick. But I don't think anyone would say that it's not safe to eat food. So I, I don't think it's a useful definition to say that's, that that's because, because there are side effects, it's not safe. Yeah, and everyone's going to have their different uh, definitions of safe and dangerous. I, I respect that, and I hope everybody who takes the shot experiences very little side effects and a ton of benefit. But I'm just saying, you know, we've been kind of gaslit over and over again that the, the products are safe. And I'm sitting back like, is it really safe? And I saw your video uh, talking about Dr. Drew and uh, RFK Jr. And you even said in that video, which is the only video I've seen of yours, um, that after they rolled out the Johnson & Johnson, they found, after telling everybody that this wasn't a side effect, that they found that clotting can happen, especially to women. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of them telling us that they know, that they researched it, that they experimented. But they were still experimenting on the public because mm -hmm. they found out through risk these other problems. No, so uh, it's not experimenting. So what happens with every drug <clears throat> is after you go through regular clinical trials, um, do you know how many people are generally uh, involved in clinical trials at, when they're some, when the data is submitted to the FDA? How many people have actually, you know? I think in this case it would be in the tens of thousands, right? Yeah, yeah. So at that point, you know, there might be really rare side effects that are one in a million, right? Or more, even one in a hundred thousand. It's not really likely that you're going to catch all the side effects within those groups that you tested on during clinical trials. So it's well understood, at least among, among vaccinologists, maybe this wasn't communicated properly to the public, but it is well understood that once you roll out a drug or vaccine to the public, you might learn more about what the side effects are. And that's why a phase four study is a thing. It's constant monitoring of the drug once it's out in the public so that you can catch things that were so rare that you didn't see it in the clinical trials. And the, the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccines are a good example of those phase four studies working and catching things that are extremely rare. That's why the, those vaccines were paused and preferential recommendations are now made where if you can get mRNA vaccines, that is preferred because those are safer. They don't have that issue of that blood clotting. Okay. Well, right. I've seen a lot of examples in VARs of people with suspicious blood clots after the shot. Um, so I, I don't know how to, I would agree with that, that you're free of clotting if you go mRNA route. Okay. But, um, we, can, we can talk no. about that a little more if you want. <clears throat> if you want to. Um, I'm just... You know, I come at it from a different perspective. I, I look back at my childhood, I took all the vaccines, didn't really have much choice, you had to, to go to school. And I look back at what they injected me with and it was laced with thimerosal and mercury. And I hold a grudge about that. And I look now and I'm like, okay, they told us that that was safe, but they were injecting me with mercury. And I see this correlation, you know, with a symptom, with a disorder that I was diagnosed with ADHD with the thimerosal. So I, I kind of look at this public health apparatus completely different than it sounds like you do. And I don't trust them one bit. I look at this overarching depopulation agenda as I see it. And I just have to be very, very concerned when these eugenicist billionaires are telling us all to roll up our sleeves and take these shots. And then we keep hearing more and more horror stories afterwards, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so I'd like us to stick to 
maybe one topic at a time moving forward. So let's let's pick pick something. Do you want to pick something out of what you said to focus on, whether it's blood clots or thimerosal or what have you, um, and then we can kind of just dive into it. Okay, um, I want to ask you the question again if you've read many VARS reports. Yeah, I've read. I think that's a very interesting uh, signal system. Yeah, I've read analyses of VARS reports. Do you not think that the source material is of interest? I think that it is not my job to go and vet every single report. That's the job of researchers, and researchers have done that, so I'm not going to do the work that's already been done by researchers. Researchers have gone through vetted VARS reports and verified the ones that are real and analyzed that data against background rates of those adverse events. And those researchers who have done that, no matter which country you're talking about or version of VARS that you're talking about, uh, they all find that though all those things like blood clots and heart attacks and sudden deaths, they're not associated significantly with vaccine, excuse me, with vaccines. I'm one of the researchers who's read a lot of VARS reports. I've videoed myself doing it. And I search for a given topic, all the keywords and any search results that come up and having any of those keywords I read out. And I have to tell you, doing it, it sounds like I have a lot more experience reading VARS than you do. So I've seen hang, hang on, do you, do you just read the VARS reports or do you, how do you determine whether or not a VARS report is real? Well, I don't assume anything about the validity of any of the reports. I have to look at them in aggregate, in total. And when I start seeing, you know, hundreds or thousands of these reports back to back, all obviously written by different people, given the syntax and how they're written. I know that the VAR system is very convoluted to get a report in, and they have big lettering that says it's, a, you know, a crime. You're breaking the law if you put in a false report. So I take that all into account. I understand that there's a motive for people who might not like the mandates to maybe put in false reports. But when I see a certain thing that's not even talked about in the media, not even talked about by who you might call anti-vaxxers, then, you know, it's it's very, very suspicious to see so many reports where it's like, oh, he took the injection, he said he wasn't feeling good, he threw up five minutes after the shot, and then he died an hour later. It's like... Okay, so, again, uh, how do you vet them? Because VARES will accept any associative report, right? Like, if someone... Say someone... Uh, died before, the day before they got a vaccine, right? That report would not go to VAERS. But if they died the day after they got a vaccine, that report goes to VAERS. It, in, in either scenario, right, how do you determine whether or not the vaccine caused what happened, what was reported to VAERS? How do you verify that? How do you determine whether or not it actually happened in association with the vaccine? Well, they're anonymized, so I can't go research them, and they're not my business, right? It's personal information. So mm -hmm. I, I can't, I never make the claim that, oh, this is obviously the vaccine that caused it. I say these are all sudden deaths right after people took the shot. Let's read all these parking lot deaths. And it's very suspicious when so many people are just dropping dead right after the shot, convulsing on the ground. You call it syncope. Um, that's definitely being reported in huge numbers. But I just can't go along with it and be like, well, you know, Fauci says there's no problem here. Let's all just keep taking shots that Bill Gates wants us to take. Okay, so so forget Fauci, forget Bill Gates. If researchers go through VAERS and actually have access to medical records, who made the report, and all that, they go through that, they verify the ones that are real, and then they take those reports and they compare them to background rates of those kinds of events that just happen normally, right? So rates of people... That's dying suddenly, having seizures, whatever, they go and say, are these actually increasing, right? So would you trust them? Would Do, do you value that kind of work? Well, it depends. It depends on what they conclude and if it is completely contrary to common sense and just reading it myself and saying, okay, this is a huge signal here. Uh, and so, I understand that they put in all the deaths that happened after the shots, or they're supposed to. Have you ever seen the uh, the distribution of deaths by day after um, the shots as far as the VARS report? It's a huge spike in the first few days, and then there's a clear mathematically significant uh, tapering off. Right, but then so when, you actually, when, when you actually 
go and analyze that and say, are these deaths unusual? Are they increased above what we would expect without the vaccines? The answer is no. Well, the reason I bring it up is because there's two ways to explain it or a combination. Either that people are dying from some insult to their body after the shot, or there's a reporting bias and not everything that should be reported. If it's, I mean, it should be a straight line, right? If people just die all the time and these are just people dying coincidentally after their miracle shot, then wouldn't it just be a straight line? No, not necessarily. For the death? Not necessarily because a death more immediately following a vaccine might be be something that would be more suspicious and reportable, right? If it's a week out, two weeks out, maybe there's an obvious other cause, then it might not get reported. Well, it should be reported according to the law, right? But that, but that well, aside, I just so, want to say, I just want to say, um, if we're hearing young, healthy people say, "Oh my gosh, it feels like I got hit by a bus." I'm sure you've seen these posts on Twitter. It's like, "Oh my gosh, that booster, the body on booster, really knocked me out, kicked my butt." Yep, well, that's I'm the immune like response. The frail grandmas. My grandma had a tragic fall and died the day of her booster. She was a big believer, like you are, in the vaccines. And she fell after her shot and died. And I'm just wondering, okay, well, maybe my grandmother's body isn't as able to handle and roll with the punches as a young person who um, is getting hit hard by these vaccines. You see what I mean? If somebody's frail and fragile, these uh, the immune response might kill them, I would think. Mm, no. So uh, I'm sorry about your grandma, but no, that's not really a thing that we see. So, I mean, I can tell stories of people who, like people with Alzheimer's, frail, very old, um, whose children get their vaccine appointment scheduled, and literally the day before they go to get their vaccine, they die. If that vaccine had been just a day earlier, it, we'd be talking about it as if it's really suspicious, but it just happened anyway it happened independently of the vaccine so you have to ask are these people actually dying from the vaccine or are these just normal rates and right, of course and, I that. and now of course and, coincidental tests. and so how do you determine that right if you're, you you called yourself a VARES researcher so how do you determine that do you, you just read the reports i don't really understand yeah i read the reports and i say okay what are the odds that this is all just coincidence that none of these people were killed by the vaccine mm -hmm. Do you think zero people have been killed by the vaccine? Is that the analysis that you do? You just say, what are the odds? Well, I just read it and let people make up their own minds because every VARS report has a text field where they describe right. what happened. And if somebody gets the injection, was feeling okay, starts vomiting, having diarrhea, and then pa you know passes out and dies or something. You know, there's been like some really crazy reports in there. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. they're yeah. fabricated, maybe they're coincidental. But when you read them one after another, it's like something could be very wrong here. And to just appeal to authority seems fallacious to me. Uh, I'm not appealing to authority. I am saying that it's not sufficient to read the reports and say, man, this must be a coincidence. You have to actually do the science to follow up on the reports and do the analysis. But and you so, haven't even read the reports. You're just going up hearsay, right? No, I've read, I've read reports, but I've also looked at the analysis. And it's not hearsay. These are peer-reviewed published studies where researchers actually did this work. Okay. Um, yeah, I just I'm looking right here at the deaths that happen within a day of the shot. It's a thousand, and when you read all these, mm -hmm. it's I mean it's just I guess we come to a different conclusion. You you come with the assumption that it's safe. I'm coming with the assumption it might not be. I'm not. I, I'm I, not. I I'm not in. assuming. I'm not assuming. I'm really not. Okay. The conclusion. Is that a better word? Concluding. Yes. Given what we know. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Well, that, that's all I really wanted to say about bars. We don't have to talk about this the whole hour. Um, I just look at all these safety signals, and a lot of my concerns have been vindicated. I was seeing a ton of reports saying, okay, I had irregular menses after I took my shot, seeing it on social media by Vax Believers, seeing it all mm -hmm. over the, the bar system. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I don't care if the fact checkers are calling me anti-science, this is a clear signal. And so I put the report out, and then a few months later, they vindicated me. And at the time, you would have said I was crazy. You would have said I'm delusional, no. right? Or something to that effect. No. And I, I, so how do you explain that? And the side effects that come up after the fact. Altered menstrual cycles, that's something that can be caused by any immune response. Any stressor, any change in sleep can even cause that. It's not serious. It's been well studied. And a change in a menstrual cycle following a COVID vaccine is temporary and very minor. Uh, this has all been very uh, intensively outlined by uh, Dr. Vicki Mayo. 
Um, so I can link some of her work and resources um, in the description later, but or, or I can send it to you right now. But um, yeah, change in menstrual cycle is not really something to worry about. Then why did we get so many reports saying, no, this isn't true, this is misinformation, fact check, false. And um, why did it not come up even in the clinical trials as a possibility? Well, uh, just, if they were so aware of the possibility that this could happen. Uh, if, what, do you, what do you mean, why didn't it come up in the clinical trials as a possibility? If this happens with shots, if this happens whenever you're mounting an immune response, then shouldn't they be on the lookout and consider that and notice it right away? So, I, taking them by surprise. so again, going back to what I said earlier, it's, it's rare. It's not something that is going to be confirmed. People, scientists don't want to just say, okay, you know, we're seeing these changes in menstrual cycles. This is because of the vaccine. Okay, you want to actually make sure that the vaccine is actually causing a change in that menstrual cycle. And when enough vaccines were given to enough women who were able to participate in studies, then we could see that there was a small effect. But it's historically expected. And again, small immune assaults can do that same thing. All right. Well, um, yeah, it seems like we'll have to agree to disagree on the safety of the vaccine. I think, though, a lot of it can be traced to what we started with, the difference in definitions of what safe means. I just think a lot of it was projected onto everybody. Like, hey, don't worry, nothing's going to happen. And something could happen. And if it's not completely safe, I, I just think it's the wrong message to say, hey, this is a safe product. Nobody's allowed to question it or attribute any harm to it. Like, I lost my Patreon um, for, quote, attributing too much harm to the vaccines. Okay, well, I, I mean, it's the idea that no one's allowed to talk about it and no one's allowed to attribute harm to, him, to them is false because, a case in point, the J&J &J and AstraZeneca vaccines. I mean, that was a big news item when it happened. And it, again, those vaccines were paused for one or two weeks. And so don't you think similar things would happen if really dangerous safety signals were being confirmed with mRNA vaccines? And, and by the way, that J&J &J and AstraZeneca vaccine for the J&J &J shot, that signal um, was strong enough when it was one in a million, literally six cases after six million doses. That signal was strong enough and uh, investigated enough for the vaccines to be paused. So even if it's rare, the system's working. So, I mean, don't you think if the mRNA vaccines were ki had killed a thousand people, someone would notice and scientists would notice and, ver and uh, verify that claim? Well, I've been looking around at the regulatory bodies, the surveillance groups, and I am not at all impressed. I feel like my leading theory is that they're all sellouts and they're just hell bent on pushing this agenda. So you think they're that they're, the you think they're all bought? They're all bought. I think there's also an ideological uh, aspect to this and a grooming aspect through the education system and indo indoctrination. Uh, okay. Well, I, I can tell you that, um, you know, as a scientist who works in a field that works toward developing drugs. We all care about our products. We care about the products that we work on and eventually go out to the public. So, and, and just the sheer number of people and cross checking and referencing and the regulatory bodies standing over our shoulders, it would be wildly, <laughs> a wildly expensive um, effort to dupe all of them or to not just dupe, but convince them to lie. I mean, I don't think that's a realistic worldview to say that all these regulatory bodies from all these different countries spanning ideologies, universities, institutions are lying or willfully being deceived for some sort of grand purpose. Well, here's what I would say to that. I, I have a personal friend, and this is, I'm gonna say something else, but he told me um, he was going to a good university. I, I knew him at my university where I went to. And he told me, hey, I've got a bunch of extra cash on me because we get cash under the table to help the results for the products in these clinical trials. He was in the clinical trial industry and he basically admitted to me that they were getting cash under the table to get favorable results. And we've heard numerous whistleblowers like Brooke Jackson inside the Pfizer trials 
We've heard Augusta Rooks. We've heard Brianne Dressen. We've heard Maddie DeGarry. I'm not sure if you know these names, but these are people yes, who I said know those that they were mistreated and that their information was misrecorded. Okay, so, I mean, that's you're, you're claiming that people are getting paid to fake results. So yes. the problem with that is, number one, that's fraud, and that can be easily caught. Number two, the way these clinical trials work is that they happen across multiple sites independently of each other. So multiple different companies will be contracted to do work in these clinical trials. And if one site is getting completely different results from another site, then that's suspicious. That you know stands out like a sore thumb. You know how confirmed COVID? They all sent their swabs to uh, Pfizer. Hang on, hang on. We're, we're, what? No, what? There's a central Pfizer laboratory that did all of the PCR testing. So I'm talking about all the work that is done in a clinical trial. It's done on multiple different sites. And Pfizer would also test the swab for PCR, but the doctor didn't have to order the swab to only go to Pfizer. Well, did you hear about uh, Dr. Deepak Kashal, who, who was instrumental with the monkey challenge study for Pfizer? He was busted by the Office of Research Integrity, I think it's called, of the HHS. And they basically said he uh, settled with their claims that he knowingly, intentionally, or recklessly fabricated and falsified the numbers for treated and untreated non-human primates for his, um, what is it, tuberculosis study, I think, or something like that. And this is the guy that they tapped to run their uh, Texas Biomed ape study, their macaque monkeys. So I, I just don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility that they're buying favorable data. And that would explain why the products are performing so much worse in the so-called wild than what they tested. So again, I, I don't know what story you're talking about. I can't, I can't you speak. You never heard that? No, I can't speak to the validity of that, but I can say that multiple animal studies involving macaques are consistent with each other, asking the question of COVID vaccine safety. So again, you know, you can say that this guy is sketchy and maybe his results are, are questionable. Sure, fair. Let's look at another study, see what they found. Oh, they find the same thing. So, I mean, you can keep, even if you don't trust one person, you can always look at more data and see if it's consistent. Because that's the thing about science. If someone is lying and falsifying data, others are going to try and replicate it or do similar experiments that rely on the results that you got, that that person got. And so eventually they're going to be found out in the scientific community. And so far we have seen that all this vaccine data is very consistent across the world. Well, can we talk about the efficacy question? We can go there, sure. Do you think that the, do you think it's suspicious that the products all tanked once they were rolled out versus what we were expecting from the trial data? No. You, so you're not surprised that they failed? They didn't fail. Are you talking about efficacy against infection? Yeah, efficacy against infection. Yeah, so vaccines don't prevent, effic vaccines are not going to, maintain efficacy against infection long term. None of them? No, nope, none of them. Wow, that's not how they were really sold to us. They were like, oh, this is the Johnson & Johnson one and done, and the other one takes two shots. Everyone take your shots, and then they, as soon as everyone took it, they're like, oh, yeah. by the way, yeah. So, so, shot now. So I know, that, I know that this was a very misunderstood point that everybody thought that vaccines mean that you're never going to get infected, but that's not what vaccines do. That's what no vaccines ever do. All vaccines prevent against severe disease and severe outcomes. They don't protect well, against infection. Well, they got the EUAs for preventing COVID. COVID meaning coronavirus disease, right? That's the acronym. Yeah, so, the, the disease. Yeah. All right. So they said it's 95% effective against the disease. I'd even go with that definition if you don't want to say infection. N no, they said, they said it's 95% effective against a positive test, essentially. With symptoms. Yeah, sure. With a mild disease is the way that um, the way that scientists would say it. Okay. And do you find it suspicious that they only looked at two months and then they said this is the efficacy? No. And you don't you don't think scientifically if we're going to be talking about vaccine efficacy, I'm using quotes, 
that we should, if it's going to wane so quickly, as they call it, I call it plummeting massively, that we shouldn't yeah. uh, try to describe it as a function of time? No, because that's the standard time for an EUA track. So in the EUA phase three clinical trial, it was decided that we were going to essentially look at how well um, how well COVID vaccines can prevent infection within this time frame. That is an indicator that they are caught in eliciting a really good immune response from the patients. Within that few month time frame, we're not going to get data on T cells and immune memory and um, all those downstream things. But if you're preventing cases within those first few months, you're obviously going to be preventing hospitalizations and deaths, which at the time, well, not obviously, um, y- yeah, that's what it's going to do in a year, two years. I mean, we're seeing it going into the negative territory against the disease they're targeting. No, after like five to six. Months so you're you're still t- you're you're still talking about infection. Vaccines well, prevent. Why is it negative? I mean, that is a low, low bar. It's not. It's, it, it's not. I mean, for me, it's just like I want it up ninety plus percent for ten years plus. That's like what I call effective. You're not going to get any vaccine in the world that is going to perform that way, but you're talking about infection. Efficacy against infection is not negative. Okay. How could you make over time? Over. Hang on. Hang on. Over time, the neutralizing antibodies that the vaccine induces in your body, right? The serum neutralizing antibodies, they're going to go down because your body's not going to continue committing the energy to maintain high levels of neutralizing antibodies like that. It just doesn't happen. So when those neutralizing antibodies come down, you still have immune memory. You still have immune uh, memory in your B cells, you have T cells, and that is what's going to kick in when the disease, when you actually encounter the pathogen in the future. And that's going to prevent severe disease by stopping the pathogen before it can replicate enough to cause that severe disease. So that's how these vaccines are meant to work and that's how we see them working. In regards to infection and this negative efficacy, again, over time when those neutralizing antibodies come down, you're gonna eventually reach a point where you're no more susceptible to infection, or in other words, mild disease, than someone who wasn't vaccinated because your neutralizing antibodies are what's going to prevent that infection, that mild disease, but those wane. So infection is infection uh, with someone who's vaccinated and someone who is unvaccinated many months after the vaccine, it's going to be pretty much equal. And in some data sets, it's going to be one or the other, but it averages out to really zero. I think, so, I, I think defining it as a function of time makes a lot more sense scientifically, also, especially if it's only like short-lived for a few months. Also, I think negative efficacy is pathetic for a product that there's is no, sold to us as a medical miracle. It's not negative so much more efficacy. Five more months. You, you, got, you got to stop saying negative efficacy. It's not negative efficacy. It's meant to prevent, well, it's, it's meant to prevent to severe disease. Two months. I'm aware. I just don't think we should let them. No. So it's an EUA track. And again, it's ongoing phase four study. So, so it's experimental. No, it's not experimental. We have billions of doses given. We know enough. We know more than enough to say that these vaccines are very effective and they're very safe. I wouldn't very call effective. that. I wouldn't call that experimental. Yeah, very effective. Well, let's put a pin on this. I want to get back to the efficacy, if you don't mind. I kind of want to talk about antigens and antibodies, since it seems like you believe in antibodies and neutralizing antibodies. Uh, what What do you base that off of? That our body. I mean, do you think that they're Y shaped, like the Wikipedia page says? These antibodies. Oh yeah, we we've seen the structures of antibodies. Yeah. And you they're think generally they Y shaped. We make a bunch of specific antibodies. They just float around in, I guess, our bloodstream. And then they just like stick onto the little spikes off the SARS-CoV-2. I mean, neutralizing it. I mean, how how detailed do you want to get here? I mean, yes, that's that does happen. Well, I've heard people calling into question the theory of antibodies, which is interesting because, as you probably know, they use immune bridging now, which is like they they inject some mice. They say, "Oh, look, we have these GMT titers, these neutralizing antibodies. This is going to work great." And I'm just calling this all into question as to what the antibody. Um, theory if it actually holds water. Why? Why? Because, um, I mean, first of all, the word's kind of weird, antibody against the body, but I guess they'd say that the toxin body 
or whatever. But um, I just don't buy this premise. I mean, I, I'm looking back to Enders and not Enders, excuse me, um, Ehrlich, Paul Ehrlich, and these initial people very closely tied with the Rockefellers back in the day. And this is a theory that has been around for a while without really fle being fleshed out, and it just kind of keeps limping along and being updated. So. I'll ask again why, and I'll rephrase the question: Why? Why do you think that a really basic tenet of an entire field, which is immunology, is made up? Why? Because I, you know, I question everything. You know, I like Hitchens and okay. oh, I used to and Schumer okay. Okay. And okay. But Dawkins. What, I but apply what, the same thing to this. I think this is mythology, honestly, dude. Okay, but 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 what reason? Like, I, you can question everything, fine, but. In your questioning, what reasons have you found to say that antibody theory is fake? Well, I've looked at the electron microscopy. I've looked at the pa some of the original papers, and it doesn't really seem like a fleshed out concrete theory. And then we look at how they're applying this technology, and it seems like they can't really hit the target in terms of making effective products. And um, I wonder if it's easier to explain this as a you know depopulation poison. Uh, okay. Um, I'll ask again, um, what reason, like you say, you looked at the electron microscopy, you've looked at papers, what reasons have you found in doing all of that to support this? Well, they say that in addition to our white blood cells, which are a part of the immune system, there are antibodies floating around, which have the lock and key mechanism and they just kind of stick into the antigens and neutralize it. And I find that to be a pretty, that's one, uh, that's one function of antibodies. That's one thing they can do. Well, maybe you should walk us through it. You're the doctor. How do you know that antibodies are as described? Well, uh, l let me just ask, um, do you know where antibodies come from? I'm not even sure they exist, man. You mean according to the mythology? You don't think antibodies exist? I don't think that they, you know, I'm not sure that they neutralize toxins. I'm not sure that they um, work as described, um, I guess is my point. Um, okay, uh, have, I hope you never get bit by a venomous snake, and, uh, I mean, you know that that's how anti-venom works, right? I'm not exactly familiar with the mechanisms of anti-venom. Anti-venom is just antibodies. They're polyclonal antibodies that physically bind to and sterically neutralize venom. Let me, let me phrase, phrase this as a question. How do you come to the conclusion that antibodies are floating around in our bodies, these Y-shaped antibodies, neutralizing toxins? Are you just saying that because that's what, like, the, the tenet of No, because so we can measure antibodies in the blood. We can isolate the cells that produce them. We can identify the genes that they use to produce antibodies. We can... Uh, look at structures of the antibody binding its target and we can also observe their action with immune cells so, Okay, let's start with that. First I mean we can we can do Okay, sure. You said that you can isolate antibodies. So for, let's look at the spike protein because this is a major aspect of the vaccine, right? They say that the mRNA goes in to our cells turns out the spike protein and then our body can work on that like target practice and know mm -hmm. these antibodies which are later useful. Uh, mm -hmm. yep. So how do we know what the spike antibody is? Is there like a mathematical equation that we can reverse engineer from the sequence of the spike protein? Or like how do we know what the antibody of the spike protein is? How do we know what the antibody of a spike protein is? Yeah. So you can... Um, okay, uh, where, where to start here? So... When, once you um, immunize something, right? Once, once the body is exposed to an antigen, it's going to produce a lot of this protein. Let's say we don't know what antibodies are. It's gonna produce a lot of this protein, right? So we can look at the protein. We can see what the structure, what the amino acid sequence is. And then we can look through the immune organs of this organism that was immunized and we can find certain cells that seem to be producing a lot of this um, 
this antibody, this protein. We can then sequence that cell's genome and look at uh, what, uh, we can see that there's a sequence in its genome to produce that antibody. And then we can grow these cells in culture, they'll just produce a lot, a lot of antibody. And then we can do experiments with those proteins. And we can ask, does it bind the spike protein? Yes, it does. We can ask, does it neutralize the spike protein? We can, we can do all those kinds of experiments. Okay. And does um, that, does that I help? Mean, it's, I, I can see why you'd say that, um, given that you think it's true and scientifically backed up. I guess I'm more interested in those experiments, but we don't really have time to get into those. I just, my point is I haven't been convinced, and the more I dig into this, because I've repeated this stuff publicly in front of a lot of people. Oh, there's the antibodies, and do we know if those are going to be neutralizing, and what are the implications of this? And then I start thinking back, and I'm like, do we know any of this stuff? And I personally so, don't. Uh, okay, so, so you, you, you've looked into it a lot. Um, do you know who Miller and Colstein are? No. Okay, you should probably look into their work. They won the Nobel Prize for um, essentially this kind of work. So, um, yeah, you, you might want to start there, digging into this okay, stuff. Okay, I'll check that out. Well, I know we're, we're, we don't have all day, so I want to go to my next question. This is fascinating to me. The viral reproduction process, right? This is something I have a really hard time wrapping my head around. So okay. they say that the um, 29,903 base pair sequence describes all the proteins that make up the little spaceship ball and spikes that stick out that go to the next host, right? And then the spike is like the lock and key that goes into the ACE2 receptor, opens it up, goes in. And um, once it gets in there, it spills its guts out as the cell starts breaking down the viral code, right? And then the, the sequences are floating around. They say that there's enzymes there that start duplicating the sequences, right? Because it's making copies. It's got to make more of the sequences. And then it says that the ribosomes start processing these sequences, start churning out these different proteins, the structural mm -hmm. proteins, the non-structural proteins. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, how do these proteins get assembled into a sphere with the spikes sticking out? They have affinities for each other. They just start so, floating around and start sticking to each other? No, they, so they have affinities for each other. So proteins are folded to do certain functions, right? So, you know, um, I mean, you could essentially ask these same questions about human cells. How do human, uh, human proteins find each other in cells and work together to form complexes? It's because they have affinities for each other. They have sequences or shapes on their surface that fit together so that they can chemically bind tightly together. And they can also have uh, chaperones, or we call them chaperones, uh, factors or proteins that can help them find each other. And so, you know, other mechanisms include the fact that these reactions might take place local within a certain local place in a cell, but I, I might be getting too into the weeds there. Um, the, the basic answer is that they have affinities and mechanisms for binding to each other built in. I just personally find it hard to believe you might call it an argument from incredulity. I guess it is, but you're saying that these proteins just get turned out by the ribosomes mm -hmm. and then they just happen to stick together into a perfectly sealed, hermetically sealed ball with the spike sticking out and somehow the nuclear capsid goes and scoops up some of the genetic strands and then it ducks into the middle of it. So, uh, um, let's see. So, Again, it's not just automatic. It's not, it's not just happenstance. It, these proteins evolved to interact with each other over a long period of time. And so once they're made by the ribosome, their Brownian motion is going to make them move really fast around a cell. They're going to bump into each other and find each other and bind. Now, <clears throat> you might think, oh, how does one protein find one other protein? But this is the molecular world. We're talking huge numbers here. We're talking um, millions and billions of individual molecules. And so uh, one thing you might not know is that not every viral particle is going to be viable. Not every viral particle is going to uh, 
be able to recruit enough genetic material or recruit the right amount of uh, proteins for it to actually go out and be a viable um, a viable uh, viral particle. That's why the virus makes billions and billions of copies of itself so that it has the best chance of success. So, I mean, maybe you're thinking of this wrong because you don't really understand the biochemistry, but also I think you, you might not be thinking about the vast numbers of molecules involved here. I hear, I hear what you're, what you're saying. saying. Um, is there any way to simulate this with a computer? Have, have a bunch of these particles. particles. I'm looking at like a diagram of the 29,000 uh, in the, the base pairs and the open reading frames and the proteins are pictured here in 3D format. You're telling me that the affinities will only bind where they're supposed to bind and won't stick anywhere else. And can we simulate this with a computer? 3D, just them floating around, just based off the protein, you're saying that it'll just form into balls? Yeah, you can simulate it, but you can also measure it. Is there a technique name for that? For measuring it? For uh, describing the affinities between proteins in such a way that these proteins can be shown oh, scientifically yeah. to build form a ball. Yeah, those are just protein kinetics, protein binding kinetics. Okay, I'll research that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's how, that's how all your enzymes uh, work. They have affinities for certain things, and they will only bind certain things and perform reactions on certain things. Uh, it's it's similar for structural proteins as well. Okay, um, and we we had some back and forth in a text exchange setting this show up, and I was asking about the drastically different attributes attributed to the uh, different variants, where they'll say, "Oh my gosh, it's transmitting five times more for each host to another." The the R naught is five times the old strain. Does that make sense to you? Like, how can something multiply its transmissibility with a mutation times? five or ten yeah so this is uh something that has not been communicated well by mainstream media um the changes in r naught and apparent changes in other things from variant to variant uh doesn't necessarily have anything to do with something that's intrinsic to the variant itself um human behavior can change the r naught uh a lot of the time so uh, for for example, you know when people are all on lockdown, there are going to be fewer cases of COVID, and that is going to change. The, that's going to affect the measured R naught value. And then when there's no uh, restrictions and people are going on holiday and traveling and uh, gathering, then you're going to have a different measured R naught value. So. Well, isn't it's, R0 it's hard to it's hard to. I thought, I thought R not was like if there were no restrictions and there was no mitigation, no public health measures. This is how much it would spread. No, no, no. R not is just. In my opinion, in, in, right? in, in, in my opinion, cases there are in the reverse engineer try to guess the R not. So, uh, in my opinion, R not is not a very useful metric. Uh, again, for, for the reasons I just stated, that human behavior can drastically influence um, those things. So again, something that wasn't communicated well by the public, but or by the uh, mass media, but you know, that's a lot of things in science. All right, all right. Well, let's pivot it back to the efficacy because with these variants, they're saying, oh shoot, this variant changes everything. Everyone needs to go get the updated bivalent booster shot. So does that play into here? Do you think variants exist to that effect? Uh, and variants exist, but the question of whether or not we need to reformulate vaccines based on variants is something that science ha is in the process of addressing and so far has some preliminary answers to. And the answer is basically that COVID vaccines are, COVID mRNA vaccines are a three dose series. They're saying three. Animal now. No, no, that's not what the science says. Science says that three doses of mRNA vaccine give you a very broad immune memory capable of encompassing all known variants. Again, for the purpose of preventing severe disease. You know what the word science means, right? Uh, sure, go ahead. Well, just, I would define it as what we know concretely, right? What we know, like the Latin science to know. So... You're, You're saying, saying that you know it's going to be three shots. shots. They're not going to roll out annual boosters. 
and that's what the science says. No, so sci anyway. science science is a method, I think, of knowing things. Science is a method. method, is a method. S science itself is a, a way of knowing. So right now, we can look at the data and make decisions based on what we know. All the data are telling us that COVID mRNA vaccines are a three-dose series. Now, you said earlier that they weigh in protection, right? And you weren't surprised by that? No. So, so they, how they, vaccines work? They don't work long-term? I, I didn't say they weigh in protection. I say they weigh in efficacy against infection, which is expected. And so, yeah, it, every, every vaccine pr behaves that way. How can you make a product that doesn't protect against infection? So if you're training your immune system to fight off this virus to be a super fighter, uh, super army against the invader, how could it not be effective against infection, but then effective against severe disease? Because immune memory. But would it, okay, so immune memory takes a lot of kick in, you're saying? Once it's re-insulted? It kicks in fairly quickly. That's the whole point of that's the, that, that's the whole point of a vaccine, is to train your immune system so that it's ready to fight the pathogen when it enters your body. Otherwise, your body would be much slower to respond, too slow, in order to prevent severe disease, possibly. So, that's so the whole a point. So question that I've been asking ever since they said it was two shots. I was asking this. Okay. Um, how is it not? How is it not experimental? If they can't tell us how many shots it's going to take in total, and there's no long-term data for how many shots it'll end up being, I think it's going to end up being way more than three shots. I mean, for many people, it's already been way more than three shots. So um, how can you say that's not experimental if you keep changing the dosing? Like, it's one thing if you say the two shots, okay, we studied that, but they keep throwing extra boosters at it with no end in sight. They're, they're, again, the, the science is very clear that it's three a three-dose course. So you're asking about calling it experimental. So two doses was pretty much all you needed for a long time. And then Omicron came around and that pretty much changed a lot. It was a completely different branch on the COVID phylogenetic tree. So at that point, we had to kind of ask, okay, um, are these COVID vaccines working as well as they can against Omicron? Or can we add another booster to expand that immune memory? And the answer is yes, we can. So calling something experimental, it's really, I don't see that being reasonable when we know enough to say things about it confidently. So we knew enough at the end of the clinical trial that it induces a good immune response, that it's very safe, and that it's going to protect against COVID. So at that point, I don't think it's experimental, even though we're still learning things. Again, you can call, just like how you, by your definition, you can call everything unsafe. You can call everything experimental if you say that we're still learning things about it. Do you, Do you think, think the Nuremberg Code is anti-vax? Oh, God. Why are you talking about the Nuremberg Code? Do you think it's a principle of medical ethics? Or should we just throw it out? Do you, do you want to explain what you want to say about the Nuremberg Code? Well, if the people who want to force us to take injections get to define if it's experimental or not, then they could just force us to take whatever they want. They could force people to take poison and be like, well, it's not experimental. No, that's not, that's not realistic at all. So do you stand for the Nuremberg Code or not? Just trying to be clear. <sighs> the Nuremberg Code was something that happened in Germany against Nazis. And then anti-vaxxers keep saying that it, it's going to happen to me. I mean, I don't know much about the Nuremberg Code, but I know that <laughs> you're not going to get forced to take poison under this, like, structure that we have for determining whether or not things are safe. Okay, okay I just wanted I mean, to get that on the record. Um, I mean, those are the main questions I have. I, I haven't really been convinced that they've uh, 
proven that there's a new virus and that they have techno technologies that can make antibodies. I'm not convinced on the antibody theory. Um, I, I feel like that's very. I mean, I mean, that's very. I don't. I don't see how you can just deny entire fields of science. Well, it's not denying. It's more like okay, if you're not going to prove it. I'm at the very least on the fence, but. I'm that, not gonna, that that's denial. I mean, it's clearly demonstrated. No. Denial is to say no. That's like well, I've asked you. Word. I've asked you for reasons here, and you haven't given me many. Well, I would think if the antibody theory was correct, that it, the products would work better. They do. They work really well. Again, I told you. I told you, serum neutralizing levels of antibodies go down over time. And we can see that your risk of infection goes up as those neutralizing antibodies go down. What do you think that says about neutralizing antibodies? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, that's like saying, well, if there's more firefighters. Um, well, it'd be like saying that, well, that's not a great example, but just because there's something correlated with illness doesn't mean that's your body protecting you from illness. But it goes it far. Be. It goes far beyond correlation. We can take those neutralizing antibodies, make, make cells that make make them in a dish, and then give those antibodies as treatments to people, and watch them get better. We can we can compare people who got those treatments of monoclonal antibodies to people who didn't, and see that they're really effective. So, what do you think that says about antibodies? Well, I can't do any of those things. If I tried to do any of those things, they'd throw me in jail. Do you think <laughs> that you have to experiment on humans? Do you think that you have to do science yourself in order to determine that it's true? That's an interesting question. I would say yes. That's wild, man. I mean, that's not correct at all. So you Sci you science science builds on the findings of previous scientists. Scientists don't have to recreate every experiment that's ever been done. All right, uh, I guess that's just my cynicism versus your belief, but I just don't go along with uh, the scientific consensus. I mean, it was saying to sterilize people back in the day, right? No, that wasn't a scientific consensus. That was an ideological atrocity. Agreed. All right, well, um, if there's anything else, we can definitely broach those subjects as well. I'm just looking here at the Walgreens COVID-19 index. I don't know if you've seen this page, but it shows the mm -hmm. positivity rate by vaccination status. And I find this very interesting not vaccinated 30.8 percent are positive and then for every other thing for vaccinated it's higher than that positivity rate and it seems like there's a correlation as to the longer you wait from your last dose the more positive the, the higher the positivity rate so i just uh, do you think that Wal do you think that walgreens is representative of the general population i think it's an interesting data set when we're trying to judge the vaccine efficacy. Wouldn't you want to look at the national data set and see what that says about things? I do. I, I would. Yeah, I like looking at that. I don't trust any of these data sets, honestly, because there's too much at stake. There's way too much money thrown around. You don't trust uh, any of the data sets? I don't trust any of the data sets, no. Then why are you talking about the Walgreens data set? Because it's an interesting result. I mean, this seems to fly in the face of their, what their motive would be. But you don't trust so I find it. it interesting. No, I don't. Do you? I see it for what it is, which is a data set, and I see it for its limitations, which is it's Walgreens, not the national data set encompassing all data reporting bodies in the US. Okay. I just don't trust governments. I don't trust I mean if, if the Nazi government said this is the fact, this is science, it doesn't mean it's true and same for the united states government i mean i don't see why a nation would be infallible i don't think anyone's infallible sure but right. we have we have lots of data <laughs> to to look at and so but this doesn't even surprise you it doesn't sound like that people are testing more positive after their shot than not taking the shots no because it's like a pretty major finding it, it's not it's not a representative finding again we look at the national data set we see a different story so you either have a non-representative data set in the walgreens data set or you know 
but you don't trust it. So I don't see why you're bringing it up and choosing to believe it. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just amazed at negative efficacy. I mean, that's so far below my standard. There's no negative. E- there's no negative do. efficacy. Vaccines remain very, very effective at preventing severe disease. That's the whole point. That's the point of every vaccine. So I think in the future, when you're talking about negative efficacy, you should realize that you're misrepresenting what vaccines are meant to do. Okay. Well, that's an important question, right? The word efficacy talks about a desired effect and whether it achieves that effect, right? Effective eff- um, efficacy. Right. The and desired the effect, effect is severe disease. Then why do they say prevent COVID on it's the EUAs? Because you're preventing the disease. Is there such thing as asymptomatic you know, disease? There's asymptomatic carrier. There's not. Is there a, as, there's not asymptomatic COVID? Asymptomatic infection. But not COVID. Again, your your COVID coronavirus disease mm-hmm. is disease. If you're talking about an asymptomatic talk infection, if you're talking about asymptomatic infection, that's a different thing. Yeah, I mean, it's a little interesting to me that it's kind of circular naming, right? Coronavirus disease points at the virus when they're talking about the disease. And the virus is named severe acute respiratory syndrome. So it makes the impression that if this this virion gets into you, it's going to cause severe respiratory problems. And the vast, vast majority of people exposed to these virions don't have severe acute respiratory issues, right? So it seems like a misnomer. It's just a name. Well, let me ask you one more one more question, and I know you got to wake up early tomorrow. But have you seen the um, American Heart Association publication? Um, somebody sent in an abstract. I'm not saying that it was the American Heart Associate, Association that ran this, but they measured the PULS cardiac score. Have you seen this, where they, it went up 2.27 times from 11% estimated five-year acute coronary syndrome risk to 25%? Is this the is this the poster abstract that you're talking about? This is an abstract. Yeah where they did it for 566 patients at their clinic, measured these different readings, plugged what was, into the what, PLS score. What was the name, the author the, name? Uh, uh, Gundy, Gundry. Right, so that was that's an abstract submitted to a conference. That's not a actual study. So do you, to use your word, do you deny this? I'm saying it's bad data. It's bad, bad work that hasn't even been peer reviewed. Okay, my question would be, why isn't there a secondary study where they try to run this data themselves. Like if there are these tests laying around that they can mess that they can measure and estimate acute coronary syndrome risk. If they weren't cutting any corners, why didn't they throw every test they had at this? There have been tons of tests looking at the effects of mRNA vaccines on cardiac health. All right. Well, and they all sh- they all show that cardiac events following mRNA vaccines are incredibly rare. And if they do happen, they're most often mild. That's but that's uh, that's across the board. But they won't actually protect you from getting infected. Is that right? Not in the, Not long, the long term. term. They protect severe disease, which is all that we care about. Who cares if you're infected, if you're not sick? All right, well, that's all for me. Um, if you want to start wrapping up, that be all right with me or any other questions you have? I mean, this was interesting. Uh, I would encourage you to, you know, read literature, read scientific literature. Um, if you're going to deny something like antibody theory, at least know like who Miller and Colstein are and the people who kind of helped establish those 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 theories, those data sets. Um, well, would you agree that everyone talks about antibodies and no one really knows like the the nuts and the bolts of it? Lots of people know like the nuts and the bolts. Lots do of people you? do. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I don't know as much as an immunologist does, but I know a lot about antibodies. It's not hard to find. Miller and Colstein's going to answer my, all my questions. It's a start. I'll check it out. I'm encouraging you to go read stuff like that. So. And I'd encourage anybody out there to see my, if you're were, if they're interested in the counter perspective. There's a channel on BitChute called "Well, Here We Go," and the last couple of videos has been delving into these old papers about where this theory originated. Just an interesting counter perspective. I mean, 
again, if you're countering it, you should know the basics. So that's my suggestion to you. So, um, well, with all respect, yeah. I just don't feel like you've really <laughs> elucidated anything as far as the antibodies go, other than saying that it's all correct and scientifically proven. And, um, it still I, leaves a lot to be desired. I can answer any question you have about them. And I've answered the questions that you've asked by explaining how we know what we know in broad terms, not going into the actual experimental methods, which I do every day. Okay. Um, my question is, how do we know that antibodies are the immune system trying to neutralize a toxin and they're, that they're effective at doing so? They're part of the immune system because we know that immune cells produce them for the reasons I explained earlier. We can measure that directly and we can measure the fact that they bind and neutralize certain proteins or they can bind and with their FC, FC region, do you know what the FC region is on antibodies? No. You should know that. The FC region can mediate other functions as well. We can measure all of those things. Well, when I look at the initial studies where they came up with this terminology, they basically look for precipitate, or I'm, I'm butchering the word, but precipitate when they uh, take a blood sample and put an antigen in. So, and they also added some other chemicals like, I think it was cyanide or something, and it just, I, I don't know, it just seems like some hand waving and, you know, just, oh, look, anti uh, antibodies. So I'm just not convinced myself, and I just see this appeal to a lot. Like, oh, we injected some rats, and we got these neutralizing antibodies. Then we're going to immunobridge, and it's good to go. And then they fail when they roll them out, and they have to roll out more boosters, more boosters, more boosters. And so the question is, how do they get it so wrong? They didn't. But, I mean, again, you need to know the basics before you can reject the established science. So, Okay, well, one last point for me is... If this is what they're designing the products to do to not even stop infection, why don't they design it to stop infection and to actually work long term? Like, why do they set such a low bar where everyone's like, oh, no, no, it's exactly you, what they designed it to do. Nobody tried to actually stop infection. Do you know what would be required of a vaccine to produce long-lived sterilizing immunity? What? You don't know? No. What? You would have to induce the body to produce neutralizing antibodies for a long period of time. And the body's naturally not going to do that, again, because it's going to conserve energy. So it's so, impossible. Yeah, you cannot make a vaccine that is going to produce long-lived sterilizing immunity. It doesn't work like that. It's the goal of vaccination, every single vaccine in history, the goal is to prevent severe disease. All right, well, that's kind of my point. It seems like they can't make good products, and yet they still want to force it. Do you, think, it's going to stop do, do you think that a product that prevents you from going to the hospital or dying is a bad product? Well, it serves no collective benefit to force everyone to take it. Oh, it does. It absolutely does. Do you think that hospitals function well when they are flooded with people who are getting sick with an infectious disease? Do you think I it think do you think it serves do you think it serves economies well to lose mass numbers of the citizens all at once in a short period of time due to infectious disease? You don't think that's worth preventing? Well, I'm not sure that these are infectious diseases as described. I don't think the science has really been uh, concrete in that regard, but Oh boy. As far as I just, uh, yeah, I think it's ex forcing experimental products, clear violation of the Nuremberg Code, just absolutely atrocious, personally. And that's not the case. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Wilson, thank you so much, and hope you have a good day. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, and again, encourage you to read. So I'll see you later. All right, well, that was interesting. Uh, let's see if I can... Uh, no, okay. Um, that's fine. I'll just keep this screen open. Well, that was interesting. Um, okay. Um, I guess I can spend a little bit of time with you, chat. Um, 
wow, I didn't know that he was going to uh, say that antibodies weren't real or that I, I, I guess he's a virus denier too. I don't know. Oh boy. Yeah, the, the, on one hand, I kind of, on one hand, I kind of like sympathize a little bit because the concept of vaccines are meant to produce or are meant to, uh, prevent severe disease is, I think is a concept that was not communicated well at all to the public. Um, I think that people did have the impression that they're going to get vaccinated and they're never going to get infected. And that's not the case. That was not communicated well at all. No vaccine prevents infection. Polio vaccines don't prevent infection. Um, measles vaccines don't prevent infection. No vaccine prevents infection. Polio vaccines, you can still get infected. You can still shed the virus in your feces, but your immune memory is going to kick in and stop the virus from infecting your central nervous system and causing paralysis. That's the whole point. That's why vaccinated people don't get paralyzed. So that's worth doing, right? Who cares if you're infected with polio if you don't get paralyzed? Oh man. But then on the other hand, it's like, it's not hard to exp understand and explain these things to people, but it, once you do it and they still are just like, no, and then it's, what, what can you do? Oh man. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be impossible for me to go through the chat. Are there any, uh, Is there anything in the chat that I missed that I should address, or uh, are there any other questions before I uh, wrap up here and sign off? Nuremberg Co. was replaced by a different ethical system in 1964. The only reason he mentions uh, that is that he is ignorant of this and Godwin's law. Yeah, I don't know any of that. I don't know what these ethical systems are. All I know about Nuremberg is that they hung some Nazis, and now people think that people like Fauci are going to get the same fate. It's really weird. Um, oh yeah, the negative efficacy. It's, I mean, it's just like, like I explained, over time, the likelihood of someone testing positive and experiencing mild disease from SARS-CoV-2 is going to be equal between vaccinated and unvaccinated. But, and, and then so when you measure that in the population, you can get certain measurements that where one is lower than the other, i.e. negative efficacy for the vaccine, or slightly above, you know, but when you average them out, you're, it's going to come to around zero. So what's the point of these vaccines, period? I, to prevent severe disease. I don't know what What's the confusion there? Get safe and effective on live stream. He seems like another expert for me to debate. Oh, okay. He's one. That's a person who's in the chat. I mean, if they want to, you know, my email and contact information is always in my videos. Oh, people are still talking about the COVID-19 or the homeless people thing. It's such a weird talking point. Look up the video self-assembling virus. Someone has made, has a virus model with magnets. Oh, we can do that right now.
self-assembling virus. Uh, with magnets that self-assembles. Oh, oh, I see what this is. Utilizing. Hold on, hold on. It's a little loud. I see what this is doing. Okay. Let's check Solid this out. Printed models of virus components and magnets representing the attractive forces between them. We can produce a physical analog capable of self-assembly. Right. So him shaking it is like Brownian motion. The uh, natural heat-dependent movement, like jittering, as uh, a, a, my favorite uh, biophysicist calls it, the jittering of molecules. That's what he's simulating with the shaking. By random shaking. The model demonstrates not only how nature accomplishes this feat, but can show some of the subtle characteristics of the stochastic assembly. Notice that the subassemblies form and break apart en route to the most stable structure. The strength of the shaking is analogous to the temperature of the molecular environment. Mm -hmm. If it's too hot, the virus will break apart. Yep. If it is in the proper range, assembly will take place at an optimal pace. Look at that. That's a great, great analogy, great demonstration. Thank you for um, suggesting that. <clears throat> yeah, jittering. It's. <laughs> I knew um, uh, there was a professor at Carnegie Mellon uh, He's a biophysicist. He called it jittering. He was fantastic. I loved that guy. Um, I don't like to say names on my live stream because I'm worried people are going to go harass people. But um, yeah, he was he was a guy who would like he made a he made a um, for those of you who know what turf microscopy is. He made a turf microscope out of a laser pointer, and you know a confocal microscope. He, he genius. Awesome guy. Um, all right. Yeah, is I know it's. I mean, it's. I don't know how to describe sitting there listening to claims like that. I just, I just tr try to have to do my best to um, try to take the claims one at a time and just imagine, you know, what it was like the first time I was learning this stuff. Yeah, I said, <laughs> I said the same thing about antivenin. Yeah, antivenin is literally polyclonal antibodies that neutralize snake venom or animal venom. Uh, have I made a video on the virus and lab leak? I, I've made a couple old videos, but um, that topic is kind of old, boring to me now because I feel like I've said most of what there is to say on it and just making more videos would be just addressing all the, all the downstream claims that people are uh, making out of copium right now. I did a great job not rolling my eyes. I, I made some faces. I couldn't help it, but yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, any other questions or points um, I think so my plan for the rest of the year um, hopefully I'm going to have time to make one more video before the year is over um, it's gonna be about Sam Bailey who um, <laughs> Google Google hangout is mad that I'm hanging out by myself um, <coughs> I would switch over to just my webcam, but when I use my webcam for an app, um, I have to like unplug it and plug it back in for the streaming software to recognize it. It's weird. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, what was I saying? Yeah, it's, it's going to be about Sam Bailey, who is a virus denier. So it's a little bit of low-hanging fruit, but it's going to be a fun video. And what 
made me want to make it is the fact that she has over 300,000 subscribers, which is insane. Um, so my next video is going to be about that. And then the rest of uh, my next two videos are going to be on the uh, round tables that Ron Johnson and Ron DeSantis have had because those are ridiculous. But those videos are going to take a lot of work because they are, I mean, the uh, Ron Johnson one's like three hours long. I haven't even finished going through it yet. So it's going to take me a long time, uh, or at least a lot of work to get through it all. So if I don't um, get those out week to week, back to back, I'll just do more live streams. I hope that's okay. Um, but as soon as I get those videos out, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get them out. That's my plan, by the way. Uh, uh, at some point he mentioned cyanide and how antibodies neutralize it, which was confusing. I'm not sure what he was talking about there. Um, yeah, he was very vague about describing these experiments. I don't know what he was what he was doing. Uh, DeSantis or Ron Johnson, both. Uh, first, I'm going to do Ron Johnson's roundtable, and then DeSantis's. Um, but I have family and friends coming over this weekend, so... Um, I'll do my best to get those videos done uh, as soon as possible. I should be able to get the Sam Bailey video out next week. Um, but we'll see. Um, will I be doing any more videos addressing Vinay Prasad's garbage takes? Uh, he's on my list. Um, always, other things always seem to come up, and I don't... Um, I don't end up getting to him. I made one video addressing uh, kind of his stance a while ago. Um, but yeah, uh, he, he's on my list. I'll probably make at least one video about him in 2023. Um, scotch or scotch? Yeah, scotch. Scotch is good. Scotch is good. Scotch or whiskey? I don't know. I haven't decided if I like scotch or whiskey better. Scotch or uh, like bourbon whiskey better. Both are good. When I was in Scotland, I got all into scotch. But bourbon's just really good, too. I don't know. I still have some bottles that I bought from uh, distilleries in Scotland. I'm like savoring them. <clears throat> um, but I don't know if they're better than bourbon. But I have a I have like a a garbage palate. I'll eat anything. Uh, did I see the piece in Waypo by Liana when? Uh, no, I haven't. She said COVID confers better immunity than vaccination. Thoughts? No, it doesn't. <clears throat> Uh, three doses of COVID vaccine confer just as good, if not better, immunity than infection and much safer. Actually, three doses are definitely better than uh, one infection, so, and much safer. Uh, has I ha have I had any more encounters with the rage quitter Jay Cooey? Not really. Um, not really. Haven't heard much from him. He, he streams about me sometimes, I know that. Um, but he doesn't actually talk to me. Buffalo Trace. Buffalo Trace is good. <clears throat> I know a few who died of SARS-CoV-2, fortunately, not close to me. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I, I know a, one of my good friends, uh, has a relative who died of SARS-CoV-2, and that relative was in their early 40s, I think. Pretty young. It's really sad. Anyway, um, yeah, this was fun. I do, I, I do like doing these. Um, I do generally like doing these. Um, to answer another question, yeah, they're fun for me. 
Are you in research in school or what work do you do besides your YouTube? I work in biotech. Um, I work for a company called Eurofins. And basically what I do every day is I do sample testing on uh, samples of different products in different stages of development. So gene therapies, vaccines, um, I'm involved in sample testing for um, purposes of like, you know, gathering data on its potency or um, efficacy, uh, things that go into like a biological licensure agreement um, or uh, just submission to the FDA. <clears throat> so that's what I do every day. Um, yeah. I left academia after I graduated because uh, I was having a baby and I didn't I didn't want to do postdocs with a baby. Uh, it's it's a really tough road to go down. <clears throat> I deserve a glass of Ardbird 16. I haven't ha haven't tried that. That sounds good. I think the Yeah, I usually get like 12 years. I'm not rich, so I can't buy like the 18 year stuff. 18, 16 year. Bourbon is too sweet. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, what is Tim Truth's channel? I don't know. He said it at some point in the, in the um, live stream, but I don't know. Smoky, yeah. I do like PD. I do like PD uh, scotches. It's a bit of an acquired taste, but I do like them. Postdocs seem often exploitative. They they kind of are. I mean, you're hugely underpaid for the amount of education and experience you have, and it's just it's it's so much work. Like no set hours. You might have to work like. 10 hour days and then at the end of the postdoc you do another one so you move to another city and do another postdoc so I wanted to settle down wanted to raise my family in a stable place and have a stable job so that's that's what I did and I get to do this for fun so it works out all right um it's getting close to 10 o'clock so I am going to go ahead and end the stream thank you all for watching I hope you enjoyed this um and I will see you next time, uh, hopefully next week with a video on Sam Bailey. But uh, until then, take care and happy holidays to all. So see you all. Thank you.